Hello and welcome to Unit 6 Video B. This is the video that you should definitely be watching or re-watching or re-re-watching if you are on the side, the con side. You are holding up the idea in the debate that the revolutions in Latin America during the 1800s were not great for the people who lived there. That's what you're doing. Well, here's the big picture. So from your point of view in this debate, um, through the cent though uh, countries gained independence, the people were still not free. Creoles ruled in the place of Europeans. So it's like one old boss out, new boss in. The Creoles, those were the people uh, who were of European descent, but were born in the New World, born in these colonies. The rigid class system didn't go away. It just left out the Europeans. Um, and there were local emperors in Mexico and Brazil, just like the kings of old. And then Latin America has had a long history of dictators since these revolutions, perhaps as a result of the um, social structures and the government structures that were put in place after the revolution. So maybe not such a great thing if you end up with dictators. So here's the issue. This is the relationship. Creoles and landowners. The Creoles, a person of European descent born in the Americas, um, before the revolutions, they had lots of power and used the revolutions to expand it. They weren't the tippy tippy top, the highest up of the people in the colonies, and they couldn't be um, at the very top of the government, but they did hold a lot of lower government posts because they were the most trusted and also racism. And then uh, they held a lot of land, which meant power, and connections to the military, which meant power. So those people uh, were able to use their power to then gain more and more power. So after the revolutions, you've traded Europeans for Creoles. The class system, even though it was legally abolished in a lot of places, informal class and race discrimination continued after the revolutions. Non-whites who became powerful were exceptions to the rule. So even if there are some examples of non-whites who became you know, upper-level government figures or very wealthy, they were unusual. That was an exception. That wasn't really how everyone's life was. Native Americans were still exploited very seriously, and it took 25 years to end slavery in most places, and Brazil took 66 years from the date of its independence all the way up until when they finally abolished slavery. So just getting independence did not immediately mean the end to slavery. Um, I think the United States is also an example of that, where we gained independence, and then, oh, I don't know, a little under 100 years later, uh, then abolished slavery. So... Here's this issue with the emperors. Um, Augustine I was emperor for about a year uh, in Mexico, but his time in power set up the struggles between liberal and conservative sides, people who wanted a democratic government with voting and people who wanted more like dictatorial or at least like one big guy who's up there making a lot of the decisions. That's um, was created during, the idea for that was created during this time of revolution and independence. And in Brazil, Prince Pedro, the son of the Portuguese king became emperor of independent Brazil in 1822. So they broke away from Portugal and they were like, yeah, down with the king of Portugal. And they're like, oh, his son, though, he should be emperor in Brazil. That's exciting. So they, were, so they got rid of kings, but then had emperors. So how revolutionary is that? And is that really great for the little guy? Now, here's the thing that's really not good for the little guy. Uh, the Latin American countries have had a really rough history of really horrible dictators. Um, and here's a good example of a uh, Latin American dictator. This, this is more, far more recent than the time period we are talking about, but it shows just how long this legacy has continued. So Augusto Pinochet is um, an example from Chile, and he seized power in a military coup. Oh, so by the way, you're writing down Chile, right? Right? Even though it's not written on the slide, you should. Now, um, he seized power in a military coup, which means he used the military to get rid of the old government. By coup means like to cut. So there's like cutting off the head of the government, old government, putting your head in place, which is really gross. Then he set up a military government, a junta, um, which is the word. And you'll see that come up a lot when there's a military government uh, set up, even now, um, whether it's in Latin America or otherwise. And during his time as dictator, there were like at least like 2,000 or so killed, people killed, 80,000 people interned, which means like taken away from their homes and put in camps and like kept there in prison style. And there were 30,000 people tortured. There's a lot of horrible torturing happen. Um, but he also instituted liberal economic reforms, which uh, the goal of which was to help the country of Chile. So why am I jumping right now to the Monroe Doctrine? Well, because it's kind of connected to the Pinochet thing. Um, the Monroe Doctrine, you'll remember from the first PowerPoint that we looked at, it was Prezi, um, 
it looks really good on paper, right? The America promises, like, if, if Europeans come in to try and get these colonies back and destroy their independence, then we're going to get all mad and, like, send our ships out and, like, wreck stuff. But um, it looked good on paper. It didn't really accomplish much early on because the United States wasn't really in a position to oppose, I don't know, all of Europe at the time. Um, but the U.S. government and U.S. citizens have since had a tendency to meddle in the affairs of Latin American countries because we had this idea that... Um, it was our domain. If Europe had the domain of other continents and controlled their own area, we were really the, the dominant superpower in our area. Superpower is not a word they would use at the time. That's fine. Uh, but, for example, we supported Pinochet because he was opposed to the communist factions and the more like liberal, um, not liberal economic, but like liberal in the sense that it leftist uh, forces that were in the country of Chile. So in our interest, we tend to support Latin American countries when it benefits us, even if it doesn't sound very good and even if it results in torture sometimes. So were these Latin American revolutions good for those countries? If you kick out your old European overlords and now you have a more local United States style overlord who occasionally comes into your country and sets up dictators? Or sends people out of the... Pe okay, so these people called uh, filibusterers, and they basically were American citizens who went over... Like, just went out to conquer South American countries. That was their thing. They're just not average dudes. You don't be average to do that. But going out to conquer... If filibusters, they're really fascinating. We might get to them. But that's the whole point. And so this video has been helpful if you are against the motion that these revolutions were good for the people who were living in Latin America at the time.